Hi, welcome Julian to episode 135 of the Best Games Period. It's awesome to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. (laughs) Well, you were the one who suggested that we do an episode on one of my all-time faves, Fire Emblem Awakening. Um, And I felt like it was a really good timing just with Fire Emblem Three Houses being out and, and all that jazz. So, uh, but before we dive into all of that, like, tell us a little bit about yourself. Wh- who, who is this Julian fellow? And, uh, you know, where, where do you come from? What, what's, what's your deal? Yeah, yeah, what's my damage? Uh, so, I'm Julian Rizzo-Smith. I'm a freelance writer from Australia. Um, I kind of run with the brand of being a gay weeb disaster in the sense <laughs> that uh i'm messy i don't know what i'm doing with my life i'm gay and i like japanese pop culture which kind of explains why we're talking about fire emblem i guess it's, it's <laughs> all of that in one right exactly uh um, yeah have you been playing anything uh right now i've literally just been playing three houses i think i spent over the weekend like 20 hours and two days on it and it's been a while that a game has gotten i've become that obsessed with the game that i will dedicate so much time to just like don't realize I've spent 10 hours sitting there, you know. Yeah, this this game eats time. And I think that, like, I've played a hefty amount of Fire Emblem. I, I have missed a couple of the more recent releases, but um, I played a lot of the older ones. And the newer ones are definitely longer experiences. Um, yeah. So I also I feel, feel like they're also... Because I, I, Fire Emblem Awakening was my first Fire Emblem because I never um, grew into, I never got into the other ones just because the art style wasn't, it's not something I'm not interested in, it's just, it didn't, gra- I didn't gravitate towards it as much as Fire Emblem Awakening, which had this huge anime art style and aesthetic, and that's in testament to uh, the character designer, uh, I forgot his name, I just viewed him a few years ago, but uh, it's just that distinct anime look that I think sells a lot of people and brings them in at first. And then they spend like, yeah, as you said, like a hundred plus hours. I think most people to finish the last game fates, it was like, you had to play it three or four different times. So it was like 200 hours overall. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you had to buy both. Yeah. Like... Yeah. You had to buy both. And then I think there was even like a third one. If you had to get a collector's edition, it had like the, 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 no, no, that's right. Each one had two vo- two routes, and then you had to get both to get all three. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just kind of... It, the evolution of Fire Emblem has definitely been really interesting, because I, I love the old ones, um, and, like, the leap to, like, 3D animation is something that I've always kind of bemoaned about the series, because I... I I like the charm of kind of the sprite work in the two, the two D ones, but um, yeah, these newer ones have definitely found a much wider audience and become like, oh, it's not just those two anime characters in Smash Brothers anymore. It, now it's now it's like they're widely recognized figures. Yeah, and it's like if you go to, I think the easiest way to the, the, to see this in the wild is just going to any like geek convention, and I can guarantee you, you will see Fire Emblem fan art. Like it is, especially in the Australian communities, like in Australia anime conventions, it exploded so much, and is still even before Three Houses came out, like years after Awakening and years after Fates, you would still see like artwork of Chrome. And you don't see that much cosplayers; it's more fan art, which I think mm-hmm. is because Fire Emblem. Uh, Awakening, a reason why I think it's such a great game and why it should be deserved as something that is, and why it's in a conversation about the best games of all time, is because it's, I think, the most unapologetic game for fans and fandoms, because it, like, leans so heavily into that shipping culture, and as you said, like, that 3D anime aesthetic, animation aesthetic, is also leaning into that, of just, like, because this was, this was the, um, Intelligent Systems, obviously, like, they thought this was gonna be the last game, so they were like, (laughs) alright, screw it we'll do anything we can to appeal to the masses and bring in as many new fans and make sure we sell more than 250,000k right and yeah. they did they did 100 percent. but it's like they brought in all of these different 
ideas that are specific to anime fandoms and the amalgamation i think is like such an incredible and like very unique experience to me i think it was my first like visual novel like game which i know it's not a visual novel but the support storylines kind of feel and play out like one yeah i can can see where you'd make that comparison yeah and it's like i think it's just dominated fan art and it's like it it was it, you could tell the way it was made, like the character designs, the whole support mechanic, everything about it was made with the framework in mind of creating some form of culture and like long lasting uh, universe for people to create stories in. If that makes sense, yeah. So uh, you mentioned something a little bit earlier about shipping culture. So what what exactly is shipping culture? All right, so shipping culture is an idea. It's 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 a very millennial concept that I believe originated during the Tumblr age and the the, the noughties. Um, so it's the idea that people will want to uh, f- idealize two characters, two fictional characters, into a relationship together. So I think it first started with Supernatural uh, and like the Sherlock fandoms are the most infamous ones in the Western media. Mm-hmm. But you have that a lot in anime. Um, especially in like shonen shows like uh naruto for instance there was always when it was coming when it, when naruto was airing there was this huge like fight between uh fans between like naruto and sasuke and, and sasuke and sakura for instance and you know, so, like characters that uh they're 2d characters they don't even really matter they're not gonna ever be in a relationship but people fight whoa whoa, like, whoa. did you just say uh... naruto doesn't matter i'm sorry i love my son so much <laughs> well i guess he's my dad now because he's older than me oh yeah i think yeah, yeah, yeah um but exactly like like that's what i mean like, like, like people get so invested right they get so into these shipping uh shipping these characters like i will die on this ship to say that momo and todoroki and my hair academia belong together and that's wild because they're anime characters and they're also like 14 <laughs> or 16 or something but it's like that like there's just this innate desire to see these characters belong together and, like, see stories between them and share experiences through them. It's, like, a weird, like, you live vicariously through them. Yeah. And Fire Emblem is designed in almost every aspect around that. Like, the, even even when you're uh, strategically, like, like, moving units around the battle, if you move them closer to each other to another unit they will work together in a fight and defend each other and have a couple of slight comments here and there like one like little comments that allude to certain things uh and you'll boost their ranks and their relationships together just from that and that's like such a small minute detail that like if you're like a shipper you just be like oh yeah it's cute you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah um so i guess One of the things that you mentioned is um, that I I guess there are a couple ways that Awakening really diverges from the old Fire Emblem games, which I wouldn't necessarily consider super uh, hard to get into. Like it's by by any means, it's not like the hardest of hardcore tactical franchises. Oh, no. Um, But it has always kind of set itself apart with this permadeath um, mechanic where if you lose a character on a map you lose them forever and fire emblem awakening introduced this casual mode where even if you lose a character they aren't gone forever they come back for the next battle and that was super controversial at the time when this game launched which was back in 2013 i believe yep um and so that definitely well that as well as the the conversation mechanic, the support mechanic. Because in older ones, you could only have support conversations with, like, five times per character. And so uh, it, it mattered a whole lot who they were paired with. Um, you could only get up to max rank with one person. And in Fire Emblem Awakening, you can match everyone with everyone. Everyone can support in all of their support conversations and yeah so like that like it, it ties into what you're saying like the goal of the developers at least for the casual playthrough was for everyone to be able to kind of get into it and make friends with these characters and i think for me because i played that game 2013 was when i was in 
year 11, which was like my second last year of high school. And I was going through like a bit of a, as, as every queer kid does, I was going through like an existential identity crisis and big bull in school. So I found that like playing that game kind of was my escape Mm -hmm. because I would, it was kind of weird. I would like romanticize characters together and have these weird bonds with characters and sort of feel like I belonged there, which is Mm -hmm. kind of ironic given that Fire Emblem has such a messy uh, relationship with same-sex relations and representation. Well, so Um, I was was actually going to ask you about that, like, because for some reason in my head, I've always thought of Fire Emblem as kind of a queer franchise or a queer-friendly franchise. But if you go back and actually look at a lot of the games... It's not, but the fandom that has kind of come up around it is, is like, inserts that into the game and builds up that element. And I think that that has kind of drifted into popular conscious, the popular consciousness about this game. Absolutely. I think that's exactly, and that goes back to the point about it being about shipping culture. I think the biggest thing about shipping culture and the internet is that it's, mostly about finding queer aspects of characters. And in most cases, the shipping, the two characters that are shipped together are characters that are either seen in pop culture as traditionally heterosexual, but they're being shipped with another male character or another mm-hmm. female character. So most, most of those crack ships are uh, same-sex relations and like male-to-male, women-to-women, they-them. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's yeah. not heteronormative. And I yeah. think that's the weirdest thing about Fire Emblem is that I think it has such a strong, such a strong queer and non-conforming uh, fandom, especially with all the fan fiction and fan others created from it. But then you look at the game itself and it's very trying. I think it's because it's just a Japanese game and Japanese games aren't necessarily open to exploring ideas of sexuality, even though they'll have a lot of very queer alluded to characters or queer coded characters um i think even even in i think it's fates uh the dancer the main the main woman and when she's dancing there's a moment it just screams as like queer culture it's just that sort of you know on the same note as uh final fantasy 10 2's yuna mm-hmm. with just like a thousand words and like the the intro pop song it feels very much like this isn't necessarily queer but it's camp i think that's like the easiest way to describe it, Fire Emblem has always felt to me, especially from Awakening onwards, it's always felt like semi, like a mixture of campness and uh, like anime. And anime has always in a way been the same notion and still always been like gay, but not explicitly gay and like queer, except but not explicitly queer. Yeah. Or if, if it is explicitly queer, a lot of the time it's made for straight consumption. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's something I think, is interesting about Fire Emblem because the queer relationships in that are uh, very little and low as the abysmal, um, but none of them feel like they're uh, in the same style as like BL or Yaoi, where it's like capitalizing or commercializing off homosexual identities. It's just not done well and not as as uh, thought out as like the straight relationships. Yeah, I so I I see fire emblem as a series that hews very closely to kind of like this neoliberal standard in in culture in general where like Mm -hmm. i feel like the only reason that there is increasing presence of lgbt characters in fire emblem is because that is an increasing market demographic that they can't really ignore when it comes to this game and so trying very little baby steps to find that sweet spot where you know everyone is happy and everyone's gonna buy this game and um in a lot of ways that's really disappointing because obviously their biggest success was fire emblem awakening which was going like it relative to the history of the series a huge radical step for for the franchise um, and they just haven't taken that in, they haven't taken that same step in like the social relationships that the game tackles and they've left a lot of that work to be done by the fandom itself. Um, yeah, it's weird. It is an example of, uh, what I feel like games are trying to do now where they're trying to let fans create content for them, but it did it in a way that wasn't explicit. It just didn't. As you said, it didn't 
give us the representation we wanted, so we tried to find it in within the game in our own way. And I think you're still finding that in Three Houses, just from, like, the way that Twitter and fandoms work. Like, seeing, for instance, Manuela, who I'm pretty sure is just as straight. I don't think you can actually romance her as a woman. But people talking about how she's, like, a chaotic lesbian. Like, stuff like that, where it's, like, a wild, ridiculous statement about a character that is, in most cases, straight. But the fandom is pushing for them to be queer. And it's that sort of idea where this game isn't giving us the representation we want, so we're trying to find ways that it could be interpreted as representation and creating stories, as you said, within the game's universe. And I think that's something that, at the time, was almost unique to Fire Emblem for me growing up, because I never really felt like playing something like Kingdom Hearts or Final Fantasy or other Japanese RPG-style games, I never really felt that I had to find queer relationships because... I felt, for instance, the queer coding of Sora and Riku, I always thought it was not just queer coding, I thought they were actually gay growing up. Or uh, Final Fantasy... Uh, Zell, I always thought growing up was queer. There's a bunch of other characters that I just gravitated towards. Yeah. Um, but Fire Emblem, I felt they never... One thing that I remember growing up, actually, playing Fire Emblem, I think it might have been Fates. Uh, so I would have been in university or college at this point, And I remember uh, the one gay romance in fates you can romance this character but and in fates the kids are inherited from the fathers and i remember i married my robin uh it's not robin it's corn i think yeah corn and niles together and then i was not able to have either of the two sons and at the end of the game the end of the trailer they showed uh the two dads playing with their sons and it felt like it was a way of like punishing the player of being like oh the characters do exist, but we're not going to give you the option to have them in your party. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually going to bring that up with regards to Awakening because, mm. um, like, essentially, I, I think this is maybe, like, I feel like this should be common knowledge, but I don't necessarily know that it is. Um, but Japan doesn't have same sex marriage yet. Um, oh. And. Obviously, the marriage mechanic in Fire Emblem Awakening, it, it's made by a Japanese developer and primarily for a Japanese audience. And so when you have explicitly marriage as the vehicle for um, creating the children who are hugely important for um, the side stories in Fire Emblem Awakening and you know, building up your team and all, all of that stuff. Um, it forces the game to hew very closely to that hetero um, point of view. Like just, just inherently that is the case because also there's a weird obsession with like birth and bloodlines in a lot of Fire Emblem games that is yeah. kind of uncomfortable if you really get into it. Where, like, oh, obviously you couldn't have uh, two two gay dads and, like, they couldn't have adopted someone in the future of Fire Emblem to send back in time. Which is a thing in Fire Emblem Awakening. Um, yeah. We probably talk about the, that at some point. <laughs> but, yeah. It's a weird convoluted thing of, like, oh, we're going to have this weird plot device of bringing in characters kids from the future but also you can't have kids if you don't like i i, I know what you mean it, there's a very easy way to solve that you could even have a character dies in the future and then it's like oh no their kid has no parents so we took them in you know there's a very right. easy way of writing that stuff in or like i because there is kind of this point of view where marriage is super super important in japanese culture and i i was reading i was reading a couple pieces to prepare for this podcast and i came across this piece by uh page takia at uh kalio uh i'm probably butchering the pronunciation kalio o hawaii um which is a campus newspaper for the university of hawaii mm -hmm. um about the heteronormativity of fire emblem awakening and there's a quote in that. I, I, I really liked this piece, so please go check it out. Um, yeah. Either you're married or you die alone. <laughs> like, 
that's kind of the point of view that Fire Emblem Awakening takes towards its characters, and it's really unfortunate. Um, like, and not just for LGBT people, but women who are infertile, men who can't, like, are also infertile. Like, that's a thing that just naturally happens, but in Fire Emblem Awakening, it's all all marriage and all baby making, you know? Like, the women make the babies. Yeah. And it's and kind like, of that underlying idea. I'm not far in Three Houses yet to marry or have characters marry each other yet, but I'm hoping that, because this feels like the first game where they've actually created it with the mindset of, like, the Western... Uh, audience in mind since it just feels like they've changed a few things here or there minus the same sex but also they've given more options for as far as farmers aware there's more options for women level women uh people and players so that's that's better but obviously the male living male is quite crap uh, but from my understanding i think i mean there's a time skip so i i don't know but so far i can't <laughs> anytime the characters are interacting and have support stuff pre-time skip it's very wholesome and it doesn't seem like it's about them getting together like marrying Mm -hmm. it's more just like how they are at school and their sort of dynamics um which feels a lot friendlier and a lot less enshrined in like traditional heteronormativity i mean that also is coming down to like another aspect of the fact that you play as like having the whole the whole premise of three houses as like a school a military school where you're training kids to fight for a war is also very like weirdly like like imperialist japan and like <laughs> kind of reflects like old japanese values mm-hmm. um that have kind of been like hidden away and like shied upon now yeah um it's interesting fire emblem is a very weird lens into japanese culture i think yeah yeah and i I think what people need to keep in mind when they look at games that are made by japanese developers that are primarily like when that happens those games are primarily for a japanese audience and i think a lot of people tend to forget that when the conversations about these games come up like i see it a lot with persona a lot of people kind of misinterpreting or reading reading things into Persona that aren't necessarily there. Um, or sometimes even like the reverse of like what the developers intended and what Japanese audiences take away from the games. Um, and so I think that's just something we have to be careful of when we have discussions about like what like, what these things reveal about Japanese culture. Um, like, I I don't really know where I'm going with this point, but, <laughs> like, just, just in general, like, it's good, it's good to be kind of, like, wary about reading too, too deeply if you don't have, like, personal, personal experience in Japan or, like, you the know, a Japanese... understanding. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that I I think there's I definitely think that's the case with Persona. I think you're seeing that a little bit with Fire Emblem, but I think when it comes to the way that same sex relations are treated, especially in the past, it does make sense why certain things are still the way that they were. Like for instance, in Fates with uh, the um, lesbian character, I forgot her name. She in her relationship, she gets drugged. Yep. So, and, like, it, it kind of alludes to, like, conversion therapy, but I understand that the way that Japan is, it wasn't kind... It wasn't intended to be conversion therapy. It's just the fact that she's uncomfortable and awkward, and it's, like, a way of subverting it, but it's... So, for those who don't know, uh, she's a, this lesbian character. The one lesbian character in Fates, you romance her, and she is awkward. I think if you're a... If you're the male, if you're a male uh, Corrin, you yep. talk to her, and she's too awkward to... She's too awkward to talk to girls, so you give her this drug or you drug her into swapping genders in her head. Like she sees men as women and women as men. So it's easy for her to talk to women and it, it's just a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And Not like, great. that's, that's another thing that irks me about Fire Emblem Awakening is that it doesn't have portrayals of any LGBT people explicitly. But it does have portrayals of incest 
and it does have portrayals of like weird age different stuff when it comes to Naoi, which is like one of my least favorite anime tropes of like, uh-huh. oh, it's a 10,000 year old dragon, but in the body of a girl who looks like she's 10. And even and- Lisa. Like, you can romance Lisa, I think, who is Crumb's sister, who looks... I, I think yeah. she's in her teens, but she looks young. You can romance her with, like, I think, Frederick or someone. Like, someone who's, sti- like, very... <laughs> like, twice her age. Yeah, yeah, it... it. I think it seeps into, again, the, the fandom culture of, like, if you can think of someone ships it, and that's kind of Fire Emblem in a nutshell for a lot of it, um, especially in Awakening. That, that said, though, the mechanic is great, like... Building those relationships, even the platonic ones, are really good. Oh, it's super of, fun. <laughs> yeah, and all of those support storylines are, like, really well written and have really interesting, like, insights into characters. And it just... To me, that was, I think, my favorite bit about it. That and having to restart every mission because someone's died. Yeah. <laughs> Classic mode <laughs> destroyed me. <laughs> um, well, and it's... For me, it's a really nice change of pace because I... I love strategy games, but so often strategy strategy games, I don't know why I'm having trouble enunciating today, um, often rely on like faceless soldiers, nameless, nameless battalions, like all, all of that stuff. But in Fire Emblem, everyone has a face, everyone has a story, and often people don't have, um, people aren't one note, like... Um, for a modern example from Three Houses, I love Bernadette a lot. Uh-huh. Um, like she's super socially awkward, but as you do these support conversations, you learn that oh, she has a passion and talent for painting. She's an absurdly good writer. Um, like, and also the reason she has this weird social anxiety disorder that causes her to panic is because she's undergone horrific abuse. And like, but that's, but that doesn't define her, you know? Yeah. And so I I like that a lot of what Fire Emblem does is put like actual characters to the massive cast um, that it puts into its game. Um, Yeah, I totally agree. I think there are so many characters from Three Houses, because I'm playing Golden Deer, because it's the best house. Uh, And (laughs) they're... (laughs) <laughs> Maybe. I I, yeah. I would say second best, but that's me. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Look, as long as we all agree that Blue Lions is the bottom tier. Oh, 100%. The only one I personally wanted to recruit from there is Dedue, or Dedue, and now that I found out you can't because he's um, Dimitri's second in charge, I'm just like, mm-hmm. all right, cool. I'll recommend, I'll try to recruit everyone but you two, so you two can just go off in the sunset like a lot of these <laughs> or something, you know. Uh, but yeah, it's the same thing where I feel like it has a really... It has a clear vision of who its characters are and what it wants to do with its characters. And I think that's in part for the writer, but also mostly due to like just this really great visual character design, Mm -hmm. Um, especially in Awakening. I think my favorite thing is seeing the amalgamation of characters and their kids and like how different they are, but also how you can see there are specific parts of their costuming and outfit and personality that are just drawn from it. It feels really organic. I don't know. I really like it. Yeah, it it's really good. And I, I was going through like a lot of the critical responses and casual responses to Fire Emblem Awakening. And I came across like this Reddit review of just like somebody who played uh, Fire Emblem and has since deleted their account. So I can't properly attribute it. Uh, but the, one of the quotes stood out to me and it's to me, the story wasn't the actual plot itself, but the character conversations like that's kind of Fire Emblem in a nutshell, because I know a lot of people, ha- or Fire Emblem Awakening even specifically, because I know a lot of people enjoyed parts of the story, but found, um, I think a lot of people in particular found the second part of, like, if you divide it into three different parts, the second mm-hmm. part to be kind of the the weakest part of the game, but overall the character interactions really buoy up everything else that's there um yeah i feel like that's yeah even in fates fates story is i think i think just in in all of fire emblem 
the best bit about it is the characters in the story. Like the characters drive the story. It's not really about the world. Mm-hmm. It's even in Fates, which has these very distinct uh, cultures of like a very like traditional like medieval fantasy or, or, like country, and then another that's very like imperialist like ancient Japan. Even then, I think the best part about them are the way that their characters are fleshed out and sort of feel and how you interact with them. Yeah, I think that quote, I think, is probably why it's become the most popular, one of the most popular things on Nintendo. Like, like give it prior to Awakening, I don't think it was as popular. And oh, I think, I, now, I think barely anyone played it prior to yeah. Awakening. And now it's sold, I think I read somewhere it's sold three times as much, like three houses are sold three times as much as Awakening. And like, <laughs> just from that. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's on the same scale, I think, as, and this is crazy if you think about 10 years ago, that it's become on the same scale in a Nintendo franchise as, like it used to be a Pikmin level of like, kind of yeah. niche and kind of like, people know who knew who it was. Um, but now it's eclipsed that and is now at like... Dare I say it's nearly as popular to general Nintendo fans as, like, Pokemon or oh, Zelda. Um, or, a fr- like, a franchise where, like, you will get a Switch and it's a staple thing you will buy. Do you know yes. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it, it definitely taps, like you were talking about earlier, it taps into kind of that fandom um, element, which is, like, basically kind of... I guess the the fandom element that we're talking about here is kind of like the precursor to social media integration that all the big publishers are really trying to push right now. So like, you know, it's the organic version of that, you know. Um, yeah, they didn't drive the conversation really. Like they just gave, in a very metaphorical sense, they gave their audience the tools to drive their own social media campaign. Which is why I think it's interesting that Three Houses, I feel like, is the first game. Because, yeah, Fates came out maybe, I want to say, three, four years ago. But yeah. now Three Houses is the first game to come out during a era where everyone's pushing things on social media more. And social media's become more of like a dominant thing in our lives. Mm-hmm. So that I've noticed the marketing campaign for this has been very, like, it's... It knows what it is, and it's very like pushing the fact that you could that that it's about the characters and who they are and all of their like complex layers and relationships, mm-hmm. rather than the mechanics. I actually don't think looking at trailers. I haven't seen that many trailers about the actual gameplay. It's more been about the story and the characters. Yeah, uh, which I think says a lot about how Fire Emblem is because like previously, of course, there was there was like like. Prior to Awakening, there were there was obviously still a story there and characters like Ike and Moth and Roy and others. I'm only naming characters from Smash Bros. Clearly, <laughs> uh, but there were others I know. Yeah. Um, but prior to that, I feel like the mechanics felt a lot more integral to the game. And I don't, I, as far as I'm aware, like I know they made uh, Shadows of Valencia. I think it's called as a remake. Yeah. Well, there, that... there's Shadow Dragon, and then echoes yeah maybe it was echoes oh, like, both, they were both... I, I think i think there was echoes shadow of something yeah that was on the 3ds and i yeah. think it kind of flopped mostly because it didn't it was it was coming out in an era where fire Emblem games had evolved and had changed and were more about like shipping characters together and that anime aesthetic and it was a very much classic Fire Emblem game, and I think the fact that it didn't sell as much compared to the others just speaks to the fact that Fire Emblem now, the reason why it succeeds is because it really is just a game exclusively for shipping and exclusively about fandom culture. And I think it's the most, I know I keep harrowing this point, but I think it's the most unapologetic love letter to fandoms because it's just every layer in it, in its design and like the way, like just the fact that we said before, like it's a game that was pushing social media before social media. I was pushing conventions of social media and like fantasizing characters and creating all that fan art before that became a thing like it was before there would be like a nintendo direct and then within hours people would be sharing fan art you know this was yeah in an era where twitter was barely even that big of a thing right well so i think i think what the fundamental like paradigm shift that we're kind of getting at with Fire Emblem Awakening is that the game 
put the characters first and foremost, which, yeah. and I think what you were saying right there is that previous Fire Emblems put the mechanics first and foremost, and Fire Emblem Awakening kind of broke the mold by allowing the mechanics to be broken. Like, it, it it's most yeah. fundamental mechanics to be broken. So no more permadeath if you don't want it. Um, you, you have plenty of time and plenty of optional battles to get your support conversations all the way up if you want. And so, like, you can make any pairing that you want. Um, and the longer you play the game, the more invested you get into it, and uh, the more you learn about these characters. And it feels very organic. It feels like a getting-to-know-you process for all these characters. Um, and... Yeah, I, I it, it just feels good. Yeah, um, even all the other supports, I feel like, all of the support missions, even the ones that aren't about, like, your player character's relationship with them, you learn more about those characters. Like, I feel <laughs> like in Three Houses, uh, there was a relationship, uh, I think it was a support with, like, Hilda and someone. Oh, no, it was um, Big Barra Boy, I forgot his name. Uh, oh, um... Raphael, yeah. Yes. Uh, and it was a conversation between him and another character about how his parents died in a, uh, like, they were merchants and they died when he was young. And then he referenced that same story in a conversation with me. And it's like, oh, this is like building this character up and saying that like, this is a moment in his life. It's not just specific to one character. It's a relationship with one character. Mm -hmm. This is something that's part of him. Right. And it's like, but I learned more about that story from a interaction between him and a childhood friend. And it's like those sort of different relationships and layers. I think three houses, I mean, awakening does this as well, where some of these characters have pre-existing relationships. So it plays off that in the support missions and some of them have never worked together. And I think it, the support mechanic draws on that and plays with that idea in a way that it really does feel like they're like slices of like a vignette of like a visual novel. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I, I totally agree that it's, Ah, oh, it's just so good. <laughs> okay, just... so so we should probably finally like get yeah. to the story. So, can you do your best to give like a synopsis of Fire Emblem Awakening? Okay, so you are a powerful, mysterious person who I believe has amnesia. And you're you yep. uh, are discovered by a prince of the kingdom, Crom. His uh sister lisa and their knight frederick and then you find out you have some destiny and you have like this sword um and then there's this dark mage and then i think you go around the world i'll go around the country recruiting people to help fight against this evil yeah people it's like a, it's a very basic story as i'm explaining it <laughs> well so like that that's kind of like the first arc because the kingdom is like getting invaded by a rival kingdom and it the arc kind of culminates in crom's sister committing like suicide or sacrificing herself to kind of like oh prevent, yeah like this war from happening and then there's a time skip and you find out that there's like this general in on a different continent uh who wants to take over the world and he might be able to do it and so you get all your old war buddies together and like go and fight him and that's kind of where a lot of people lost the thread of the game and like really didn't like what was happening but it gets tied back in later so you go and defeat this general who's named Walhart. And you find out that he was actually opposing the evil organization that wants to, like, resurrect the evil dragon that will destroy the world. Um, and then the third part of the game revolves around, um, like, obviously ripping, ripping the band-aid off of why your character has amnesia. And it basically turns out that they're an avatar or they were they were created to be an avatar of this evil dragon god to destroy the world. And while all of this has been happening, uh, characters from 10 years in the future have been like traveling backwards in time. And it's never really like super explained how this is happening, but it doesn't really matter. Um, 
Like, like that that's kind of the thing with this game. Like, any plot holes, it's just kind of like, well, it doesn't really matter because that's not what the game is about. Um, they travel back in time. That's how you meet all of your grown-up sons and daughters and whatnot. And uh, the final act of the game reveals that not only have all of these people traveled back in time, but so has, like, the evil avatar of destruction, who is actually you from another, from, like, the future. Um, I don't even remember this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, the reason... So, the game opens with, like, a premonition of the main character, Avatar, uh, killing Krom. And then that scene plays out again during the third act. And it's basically your character has that premonition because the other, like, the, the one from the future, the Avatar from the future came back in time and so like you're not seeing you're not seeing the future you're seeing what that character did because you have like this weird mental connection um and so what i'm like you end up saving crom and there's but they end up resurrecting the dark dragon anyway just not in a human form in like a dragon form so it's like flying around and the final like the final battle is basically on the dragon's back and you have to decide whether or not you're going to sacrifice your avatar to like permanently kill the dragon or let Krom hit the final blow and uh, send it back to sleep for a thousand years or something. But what I found really cool about that final conflict was that a lot of it draws on the bonds that you've made with all of your fellow characters like the the in in universe reason that your avatar character is able to kind of like do battle with this dragon is because they have made all of these strong connections and bonds and you are like an extremely powerful avatar creature like and that's really cool like i i was just like oh this is this is kind of rad um yeah it's who like leads into like it's almost like the story leads into it the the support mechanic as if it's like a deeply entrained in the actual story itself i think exactly yeah 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 it's also very anime i think <laughs> oh like, yeah definitely I like I, right? i'm able to do this because my friends believe in me <laughs> yeah it's like so stupidly like based around that like power of friendship dynamic, but it's so is... good yeah but that's why it works <laughs> like it's so like stupid and goofy in that like lovable like almost saturday morning cartoon way right and so i would also suggest that anyone listening or watching check out a piece by adam i'm gonna butcher this last name i'm sorry adam adam beersted uh b-i-e-r-s-t-e-d-t however you say that yeah uh, on uh what a terrible fate or with with a terrible fate.com um but he he wrote about kind of how this is a meta narrative and how it brings the not it's not specifically about the avatar it's actually about the player because the player is the defining difference between why the avatar in this timeline was able to save Krom and why the avatar in the future timeline was not and so it, it's a really compelling case and a really interesting way to reframe it at, in a way where not just the avatar is like overcoming and like contributing to the narrative, but you, the actual player as a person in the real world, are having that tangible impact on the storyline by by your connection with the avatar, too. So it's not yeah. just it's not just all the characters in the game and their connection to the avatar. It's also the player's connection. So it's like all I don't know that that's really cool to me. That's like a really cool storytelling thing to me. I get I get jazzed about stories in games and that that's a really cool way of incorporating all that stuff. Yeah, it's very rad. It's that very like it's it's creating a personalized like impact without you actually doing much right uh, but I, I, I yeah i love that sort of thing where uh, all of your like assumed decisions play out and like come together at the end of a game that way it yeah it's it's 
I feel like the story itself is quite cliched, but that moment at the end does sort of justify it because it's sort of la- all those layers of relationships you've built over the last, like, I want to say 60 to 70 hours because it's a long game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kind of come to the top and just sort of like, yeah, I, I, I feel like you don't see that a lot in games, even ones that are all about like player's choice. Mm-hmm. Um, even stuff like even more like Western RPGs that have that like Fallout or um, uh, it's another game that I forgot. It's not Fallout. Uh, Mass Effect is the only one that I can think of where Skyrim. Like, Skyrim, yeah, but Mass Effect is the only one I can think of where or Dragon Age. Um, Bioware is in uh, has that similar thing where. All of these characters uh, you've met come back and it's all about like how they all interact together and work together to defeat this great evil. And But that's more about your relationships in general to them all. It's not about your personal connections with them. Right. Um, I feel like this specifically is like, yeah, it is, it is a meta-narrative. It's like looking at all of those relationships you had and all of the personal support dialogue you've had with all of them and how that's like powering you. Yeah. Which, like, again, you said, seems like it should be really cliche, but this game makes it such a fundamental mechanic to how everything works, and then brings it back around on that narrative level that it actually, like, comes, somehow, like, transcends the cliche a little bit. Yeah, I think that's, I think personally part of that is just because also the anime aesthetic of it makes it, like possible like it's like oh this makes sense because it's it's very anime inspired so it doesn't surprise me that it has a very anime-ish style like ending or like tones in the story um yeah i i feel like you don't have that as much with fire emblem fates i realized i mixed the two uh endings i think together because i remember i thought in the end of awakening you fight this but i think this might be the general this like evil old man who's got a crown and you fight him on a ship or some sort of like sky ship. That, I mean, there. I mean, you're in the sky on the dragon, so maybe. maybe? I don't I, know. I never. I, just, I never finished Fates, so I don't know uh, if that's what you're thinking of or not. I don't know. I finished the two uh, individual campaigns, but I never finished the hardest one because I was like, I'm not going to play this game for a third time. It's like, <laughs> I, I can't. It's too much. Get, it's too much. And I think you start off with like only three of the characters, like the main character and his two maids. And I'm like, that's no, it's going to get thrashed. But I feel like Awakening is, is like c- compared to Fates. I don't remember Fates doing that. Fates was all about the characters and you were just sort of a bystander. Whereas, yeah. like, like a mysterious bystander. Whereas this, it sort of seems like it's about your place around them all. Which, yeah, it makes for a more personalized ending. And Three Houses is kind of doing that so far, from where I'm up to. It's about, like... I mean, Three Houses feels like a mixture of the two, because it's all about, like, where these characters are all going to go, but also how you're going to influence them and, like, inter- and how your interactions with them are going to define and shape their path. Yeah, I, I find Three Houses really interesting because it makes... Where, whereas in Awakening, your player character is basically... It is not the main character. Fire Emblem Three Houses makes you the main character in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, because you, you are their teacher, you are their mentor. And that's a really interesting change. And I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes. Um, I have a feeling like after a time skip or something like that's that dynamic is going to shift back to kind of what awakening was, but we'll see. Yeah. But I also feel like after having half of the game with that dynamic, it will also make it like, it won't be exactly like awakening where they're all equal. It'll be a weird sense of like, they're equal, but also there's still a level of respect that is like a mentor sort of relationship. I do really like the way that, uh, three houses, plays those relationships out it is a bit i'm a little bit worried uh about (laughs) yeah (laughs) about like right like because there's like i don't know it's a bit sus and a bit like unethical to have relationships with your students and i mean yeah there's a weird like i don't know if the ethical thing in this game is to only try to romance the professors um that that doesn't seem that doesn't seem right either (laughs) <laughs> no, that, does, that also seems dodged. Like, I feel like the, like, 
and you can't you can't, you can't really go for any of them because everyone is either a teacher uh like like a, a, a the colleague a student or is like 13 or in the soul of like a like a 10,000 year old spirit yep whatever <laughs> like that girl who just hides in your room yeah pretty much yeah, like I, I don't know maybe like maybe the dynamic changes once they're all <sighs> yeah i'm i'm kind of like uh, on yeah. this I, I need to see how it plays out it also depends like how long the time skip is because I, right. I don't know how long the time skip is but i know i semi spoiled myself with like a comp- accidentally seeing like a comparison of two characters what like or a character um before and after I don't really know anything about her, so I'm like, oh, it's all right. I don't think I'm going to actually recruit her, so that's fine. But she went from, like, a kid to, like, a proper adult. And I'm like, how big is this time skip? Because if it's big enough that intelligence system... It's 10 systems... years? Yeah, if the, if the intelligence system is literally just like, all right, we're just going to make it so far, like, the, this time skip so big that you won't ever have a conversation <laughs> about, is this ethical? I mean, it's been, like, five years since I've been your teacher. It's still it's pretty the... weird. Still weird. Like, but, it's, it's but a bit maybe, groovy. But maybe 10 years? Like, if there's just, like, a 10... I feel like that 10 or 15 years, maybe you're getting into, like, a period where it's, like, less of a problem. Yeah, 15. But, like, 15 years by then, like, that's a lot. Like, I, the other professors <laughs> probably won't be around by then. <laughs> <laughs> like, there are a decent amount of them that are, like, old. I mean, maybe not Hanneman. <laughs> Hanneman? The, the the guy with the mustache, the, the crest professor. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, it won't be right. Or, like, <laughs> Tomas. Tomas probably won't even, like, yeah, probably last not. five more. Yeah. Probably not. Anyway, it's getting, like, weirdly morbid. But I, I really do <laughs> like the way that Fire Emblem plays with characters. I especially also, like, this isn't something that's specific to Fire Emblem Awakening. It's more specific to Fire Emblem. But, like, the classes are really interesting, and they're very, mm-hmm. like... I like the way that that weapon triangle works of yeah. like sword, axe, axe. No. Yeah, sword, axe, axe, lance, lance, sword. Yeah. I th- yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And like, I like the way that it just, I don't know, this, this is like, it's a really cool mechanic and also like adds to the personalized impact of your, like, how it feels very personal in creating these characters and having specific classes and like a design for them like when i saw for instance uh mirabelle i was like okay you are gonna be paired off with virian because you're both very aristocratic and very high class and it's a very <laughs> fun relationship i also feel like you should be on a horse and be a healer <laughs> so then she was like a healer and a horse and that yeah. works with her yeah and it's like you have personal you you each like every player i think who fire emblem has a specific way of how they want the character to be and how they feel the character is and they're 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 like classes and things how they fight and i think that brings it back to that idea of fandoms and like fan fiction because it's all about how you fantasize about these characters and what you see in them and it's almost like a role play agency and i think that's definitely something you see in three houses in that it kind of takes that role play aspect and makes that the actual protagonist's sort of character because yeah you're, yeah, yeah yeah like right because the whole point is that you're supposed to be like training these kids like, that's not just the mechanics, it's the story, at least for the first half. Yeah, and I think this is where I kind of get a little bit um, torn about the, the casual and, like, the classic modes in Fire Emblem, because I do feel like there is a lot lost if you play on casual mode, because part... I guess a, a big part about Fire Emblem is is warfare and i guess it as much as it sucks like an ideal playthrough of fire emblem should it result in a few people dying like not just in cutscenes, right because yeah war is terrible right and like that's yeah. something that the game repeatedly tries to emphasize in a lot of its storylines and it kind of falls back on this um well we have to fight because you know, like they're they're just pure they're pure evil. Like our adversaries are pure evil, and we have to fight because otherwise, you know, we're we'll be destroyed. And I would love to see, like, especially now that we've gotten to three houses. Like I've always felt this way, but with three houses, I can kind of like see maybe a path forward here. But I would love to see 
a possibility of like a non-violent playthrough of a fire emblem game like because you have now now you have like the management sim element in Uh like center to fire emblem in three houses and like put put a lot more emphasis on the social interactions because that's kind of where the game has been going anyway and make it into like this like having to balance like a diplomatic tightrope and if you fail well then you have to fight right but having the first the first option be like diplomacy and like trying to talk it out and like you know how you manage to walk that tightrope is also determined by how well you can manage like your location whether it's a school or a country or like a hamlet or whatever um, yeah, I totally think that could work. And you could also tie that into, like, stats, like charisma or something. Right. Or, like, if you're in a faction where a specific character is from and you have a really strong relationship with them, like an S-class support or something, it's like, oh, you have a higher chance of not having to fight them and sort of solving this through diplomacy. Yeah, I definitely think over the games it's gradually gotten more social and gradually gotten more... I guess it's it's been less about the fighting. I was actually playing it recently, mm-hmm. so I was playing played it over the weekend for two days, basically two days straight for twenty hours. <laughs> and one of my housemates uh, walked past, and he was like, "What? This game has like very little fighting." And I sort of sat there. <laughs> it's a lot of running around the school in the day. yeah. And I'm like, y- you're not wrong. Like a lot of what I was doing, and a lot of what you do at three houses in the month is like micromanaging, as you said. I'm like going to different like supports and checking out, like, seeing all these different relationships play out and, like, doing all these dumb fetch quests around the, the city uh, or the town, and it's very little fighting. And that's fine, because the fighting's great, and I do genuinely still like Fire Emblem's battle system. It's great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but I do think that where it excels at is building those characters and that dialogue. I think they have been... There are a char- few characters in Three Houses that have a bit of, like, an awkward delivery in some lines, but I think that might just be uh, some of the characters, or I don't think it's necessarily the localization. Like, Petra has this really... I don't understand. I, I have to, like, sometimes reread what she says, because <laughs> it's... I love like, Petra so much. It's She's very, like... I guess it's, like... it. It makes sense that she's voiced by the woman who did uh, the voice of Violet Evergarden because she definitely oh, really? has that very like yeah okay. yeah yeah yeah. Um, so she has that very like robotic like robot trying to imitate human speech and mannerism sort of dialect. Yeah, how she talks, uh, which is great. Like it makes sense, and I'm sure if I understand who she is and get to know her as a character, it will make sense and I'll fall in love with her. Um, and she does look very cool. Like in the in the three battle that I had, uh, where I fought the other two houses, it was like she she was the one who stood the most. Like she survived the most in that house in that battle. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, but I digress. I think that there's a very interesting. Uh, I forgot my train of thought. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, battle systems are still really good fire emblem, but I do agree that it's not like it's not. The like it's gradually become less and less the biggest point of the game and like the selling point. I well, think... like the the biggest the biggest gripe for me is not even like mechanically because like what you said is like it it feels good. It's really interesting and fun to play. But also, what I guess what gets me is the like they they have essentially built a war game where every single it's not it's not just like fire emblem three houses but like almost every single fire emblem game is about like characters who don't want war but yeah them not wanting war isn't like i i don't know i i find i find it frustrating that uh there's just like no no attempt at portraying like a peaceful dynamic i guess in this and again, I know it's a long running war series, so maybe this is just like a, a weird complaint of mine, but I don't like that um, the mechanics of their game fly in the face of like the goals of the characters, I guess. Yeah, it's very contradictory. Right. Like, yeah, I guess we're, we're going to make we're, make we're going to make a game where like characters soliloquize about peace, but also you're only mean you're like 
few meaningful interactions with other like political entities or or factions, it's going to be murdering them. Yeah, I think again, like we're speaking about three houses in a very like potential in a way that talks about the potential of it because we're not that far into it. Right. But I think the way that the slight story threads that started like beats in the first like 10 hours of three houses there's like a specific quest that i noted that uh kind of hinted at war is bad and i feel like fire Emblem has this weird dichotomy of trying to show that war is bad and that, and that ki- these kids don't want to fight as you said with the like by contrasting it with actual fighting and i think that's supposed to in a way, I feel like it's gradually trying to, like, represent both, but also, like, show a mirror to their faces, but it doesn't do that as, like, explicitly, so it does come across as a bit, like, clumsy. Not a clumsy, like, a like it's not bad. It no. just it just doesn't feel very streamlined, I guess, in that sense of, like, if it's a story about kids who don't want to fight but realize they have to because it's, it's what they have to do because of shitty circumstances, but maybe give them an attempt to... I guess that's what the talk function is in battle, but you don't really get to use that often. Like, if there's a bandit, right. you can't be like, hey, maybe leave so I don't kill you. Or, like, you would think, like, if it's a bandit, like... Maybe you could... Like, give them money or something. Yeah, exactly. Like, bribe them. Yeah. yeah. Like, there are... I mean, this comes back to your point before about if we could, like, if there was some form of, uh... Like... If you could negotiate with factions and negotiate with enemies uh, and use, um, oh my God, I forgot the word. Uh, so it's with a D. Uh, diplomacy? Uh, yeah, diplomacy. Yeah, I forgot that word. Uh, if, you, if you use like diplomacy and di- diplomatic tactics rather than, than uh, military tactics, I think that would definitely open up the game. I think that's the next thing that Fire Emblem can really do. To make the next game because obviously they'll make another game now that yeah. three houses i think has sold the most of oh yeah guys a hundred percent yeah <laughs> yeah oh and they're gonna they're gonna release so much dlc for this game oh absolutely and i will buy every single one i don't buy mm-hmm. dlc but i'll buy every single thing <laughs> i'll even buy like the like crappy anna dlc that's gonna come out where it's literally just like you fight a bunch of people and then you get anna and I'm yep. like i'll do it i yep. love her she's great yep um i like it just opens up so many possibilities of like hey you know that weird ugly and aggressive bandit character maybe you can actually like end up recruiting him and and maybe maybe he's not so evil right exactly that that's one of the things that has bugged me about fire emblem is so much of like i love the character design in general but a lot of the character design for the villains really goes hard on making them like they're ugly evil like or like evil ugly you know what i mean yeah and there's like very few characters like the few that you can recruit in that in those battles are usually ones that are running away from those enemies they're Mm -hmm. not usually like like if there's a character that's recruitable that's an enemy you can tell just by the fact they look way more like your party than the people surrounding them right and it's it's like (laughs) It's too on the nose. I know what you mean. Um, it would also be cool to even be able to, like, even if you can't recruit someone, like a bandit, for instance, if you can negotiate with them and try to have a conversation, and if they shoot it down and are like, I'm going to attack you instead, it's still that level of, like, having that choice would make it a right. bit more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I do, I do agree the bandits are all, like, like especially three houses right now, it's just <laughs> I feel like I've mostly been fighting. Yeah. Uh, very... <laughs> um okay so the guinness book of world records currently recognizes fire emblem awakening as the most critically acclaimed handheld strategy game of all time so i want you to make the case for like why that is and why it's one of the best games period one of the best okay. games of all time um well i think it's <laughs> oh all right I think it's the most critically acclaimed, critically acclaimed Hand, handheld game? Handheld strategy game. Handheld strategy. Well, okay. I think that comes down to the fact that it, as we said, like as we've been talking in the last hour, it has all of these layers that make all of these individual units more personal to you. And from there, the classic mechanic 
Uh, so obviously there's the casual version, but the classic mechanic, there are all these different, like, all, the way that Fire Emblem is made and works, it is based around two different ideologies, strategy and fandoms, right? And it combines those two in a really organic, streamlined way by making you care about all of these characters and have all of these intimate relationships with them and then putting them on the battlefield and with these interesting little, like, strategic elements. Uh, and from there, if they die, it matters more because you've built these relationships with them and they've become really interesting people that you've learned to care about. Um, yeah. Why I think it should be considered the best, like, on a best game of all time sort of, like, list or yeah. potentially the best game of all time is purely because, as I said, it is the most unapologetic game based around fandoms. And the way that it's influenced fandom culture, especially in the, like, convention scene, is something that I don't think I've ever seen before. Like, I think Persona is the closest thing in Smash Bros, but those already had fandoms well, smash bros already had fandoms by being based around all these different cultures and all these different right. uh, franchises and mascots right whereas fire emblem made characters and made a cast specifically to create a shared universe and like make memorable characters i don't think i don't think i've really like played a game in a while that i've come across fan art even just like anywhere even on instagram or twitter like six years later, or like like frequently, um, it also because I would like to bring this up uh, as a <laughs> as a teenager has influenced me to. Um, oh boy. This, this is an example. Here we go. Here we go. This is an example of the kind of fan art that Fire Emblem. So Fire Emblem fan art is either very wholesome and about like relationships, and they're very intimate, or it's uh, oh my, just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or it's uh, like this. Um, now, as you can see from, mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm gonna, I can't hold that and stay true to it. Um, of course, so, of course, Gaius is on it. Of course, Gaius is on it, but Gaius isn't even the best. The best to me, of course, is my sweet boy Chrome, and also Frederick. I love them. But the fact that their characters, that like Frederick, has very little personality in a way in his in like his character, but the way that he's designed, like all, all the way that these characters are designed, they tell a lot about them, even if they might seem very one note yeah uh, i don't know i just i just think it works really really well and this game would not have been the would not be in the goodness world records for the most critically, the critically acclaimed mobile strategy game or be considered as the best game of all time if it wasn't for the characters and the way that intelligence systems have weaved that together with like organic storytelling okay yeah cool okay so one one last question, because we kind of got into like hypotheticals. What could, like, what could the next Fire Emblem, like, whatever comes after Three Houses, do to, like, kind of escape its heteronormative roots? Oh, I mean, this would never happen, but have a queer person help make it. Uh... <laughs> yeah, New Blood. <laughs> Yeah, new blood. Uh, I think the character design is fine um, because I mean, the thing about Fire Emblem is it does have some horny character design, but it's not based around fetishizing female characters. Because if you look at like, like they're class specific. Because um, in Three Houses, uh, Raphael has this. There's a brawler mode of uh, a. I think it's only for men. There's a brawler class, which is like the sort of brutal, like fisty, fist cup one. And uh, it's like a very gladiator sort of look, and they have very little clothing, and it's like that's all that's that's like that's sexualized. And then there is like the female dancer, which is also sexualized. So I think Fire Emblem Fire Emblem does it in a way where it tries to sexualize everyone, which is something you don't really see in JRPGs, right? Um, but that I think is already helping pushing it to be a bit less heteronormative. But I think to do that more, you need to have more male objectification if that makes sense <laughs> i think yeah i think if you balance it out a bit um and in doing so you'd make it more friendly and queer friendly and also just having having more queer characters but also having queer characters treated in exactly the same way as the straight characters are in straight relationships like the amount of times i i genuinely don't know who i'm gonna romance in this game because the only option for a gay person, a gay male to romance a character in this is just, I, I don't find him interesting. Right. And it's like, 
the fact how in this game there is so many interesting lovable characters that I've already fallen in love with the first 20 hours, but when it comes up to the decision of who I will want to marry, I only get to choose one, like, sucks so much. Right. And I think if they just gave more variety for us, I don't think I would have any other complaints. Yeah, the the variety is a big one. I also really wish that they would do away with gendered class stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, just be... And hey, maybe give us a non-binary character. That'd be pretty cool. Like that, I, it kind <laughs> of astounds me that we don't have that. I mean, I know Fire Emblem's track record, but with what at least thirty characters in this, you'd think that one. And a lot of them, like some of them, are a little bit uh, queer coded. Like it, yeah, it would be so easily to make like uh, what's the name, uh, Lorenz, for instance non-binary mm-hmm. or Bernadetta Bernad- yeah Bernad- Bernadetta Bernadetta like they could easily be yeah uh, non-binary you know it's 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 really not that hard I am a little bit worried though in how they would represent that just because of their track record yeah um, which it kind of sucks that because I as I said I played Fire Emblem Awakening when I was in high school and I was questioning who I was and that and Persona were very like influential pieces of media for me and it kind of sucks that I fell in love with these characters and it was my way my my escape from bullying and questioning who I was but I didn't actually I wasn't able to explore that in the game right and I think if future games did that and, and like someone a younger person uh, that, that's much like me played it they would get a much different experience and I don't know it would just I would feel more welcomed in this game in this universe that is very clearly to my interests but it just doesn't feel like it's for me also, it'd be great because I'd be able to be horny on main. <laughs> yeah. I Well, I mean, the fan art you have was basically horny on main, right? Oh, absolutely. But it's, it's hidden, usually hidden away behind like, in there. <laughs> fair. Fair. Yeah. Um, well, is there anything else you kind of want to, like, add at the end of this? I think Fire Emblem... I mean... To bring it back to the whole conversation, the reason why I think we're talking about Fire Emblem Awakening instead of any other Fire Emblem games is because it did start off this trend of making a game for a fandom rather than making a game with the mindset of building a fandom and to celebrate the culture of fandoms instead of making a game and then fandoms falling into it. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also think it's the first, it's the game that has, in in the Fire Emblem franchise, it's the game that has the most distinct and recognizable characters. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. fair. Like people, people still like reference Tharja, for example. Yeah, Tharja. Or... Like, if you look at Tokyo Mirage Sessions, which is a criminally underrated game that needs to come to the Switch so I can play more of it. Agreed. Uh, most of the ca- I think most of the Fire Emblem personas in that are from Awakening. I think there's Tharja, Krom, and uh, Virion, whereas I think all the others are from like specific one other games yeah and it's like that speaks to the fact that awakening has such a unique cast and was such universally loved by fans that when a game when 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 atlas and intelligence systems were making a game based around fire emblem characters they chose three from that game french and that game you know yeah i i'm still i'm still looking for uh the equivalent of my favorite little kettlehead uh, from Fire Emblem Awakening. Is that Donald? Yeah. Yeah. Oscar's not the same, or whatever his name is. The new kid? Yeah. No, he's, he's not. not. No. <laughs> um, okay. Well, uh, Julian, where can, where can people find you online? Where can people find your work? Yeah, uh, you can find my, you can find all of my hot shit takes on uh, Twitter at Gayweeb Disaster, where I also generally tweet a lot about uh, anime, video games, comics. Uh, I do videos for Kinakuni Australia, uh, comics and manga videos. I also write about uh, video games and whatnot for a bunch of places. Um, yeah, I want to do a bunch of podcasts in the future, so if you follow me, you might get to hear them and hear Jack on. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on. This was a super fun discussion and a great time to just kind of like gush and like really dig into like certainly one of my favorite games. Oh, uh, sorry. We 
we we didn't do it. So officially, you think that this is one of the best games of all time? Yes. Okay. I officially think Fire Emblem Awakening is one of the best games of all time. Okay. Same. Uh, <laughs> we'll throw up a poll uh, when this episode goes up next week. And uh, we'll see we'll see what other people think. I also would like to see uh, what everyone's favorite Fire Emblem Awakening character is. Ooh. That's gonna I feel like it'd be a fights. toss up between Thaja. Oh, absolutely! But it's probably gonna be like Thaja or Virion. I mean, actually, not a lot of people like Virion. I love yeah. Virion. Definitely wasn't my great. favorite, but he is great. He's great. Also, Frederick is great, and Crom, and uh, oh, that woman. She's like she's like from the other kingdom, and she's like a, a swords master. Oh, Sairi. I think Sairi. She comes with. She comes with like this one other. Oh no, there's her. There's Long Q. Yeah. Uh, uh, I love Long Q. Long Q's great. I think Olivia's great. I think Chelsea is her name. There's like a Wyvern Rider with a C, although she died for me. <laughs> um, Henry's great. I love Henry. Yep. I could go on about like all of these characters. Uh, yeah. It's just... For sure. <laughs> I, that's kind of why I didn't like dive into like the character stuff. <laughs> just because we'd literally just be talking about how great everyone is. Oh, absolutely. And, like, all of their little... Like, my favorite thing about uh, the Virion and Maribel relationship is that they're kind of constantly trying to one-up each other on, like, being more upper class. Yeah. And it's the most ridiculous, like, oh, will I drink (laughs) high-class tea? Oh, will I have a horse? And it's, like, this... (laughs) stupid like it, it almost feels like something like out of like pride and prejudice or some sort of like victorian era like bullshit it's like <laughs> great great i would love to be like a localizer in that game that would be so much fun oh i bet they yeah i bet they have a lot of fun yeah um well i bet they also run into a lot of uncomfortable problems um yeah i'm curious how they would like how they try to go about like handling that from a western perspective yeah I mean, I know they, I know localization, like, took out some weird, like, massage stuff from Fire Emblem Fates. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, uh, it's, it's, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming on. It was really fun having you on. I, this was great. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was so much fun. I, I would love to be on again in the future. Heck Yeah. Come on, be a friend of the show. Um, and now I'm just going to give my ending spiel. So basically, hey, if you haven't heard of Extra Life, you should definitely check it out. It's a fantastic charity for sick and injured kids. Um, and basically people raise money by playing games to help kids in hospitals uh, across North America. So it's really great. You can learn more over at extra-life.org. And uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, you can follow us over on at best games period on Twitter. We also have a Patreon. If you enjoyed the show enough to like send us a dollar a month, you get access to a bunch of unique episodes and uh, you can also donate more and get access to some of these live streams that are super special. Uh, We're going to, we're going to keep, we're going to keep it open when, whenever we have guests though. So um there's that uh up coming up later this month uh we have tabletop appreciation weekend for extra life so be sure to check that out you can find this podcast on community.extra-life.org as well as uh spotify libsyn itunes soundcloud all of the places we are there so please give us a subscribe and maybe a thumbs up or whatever so (laughs) uh julian just froze in the best the best uh (laughs) uh And uh, with that, we will see you next time on the Flippity Dippity.